pleased to, uh, rep to present Corey Glick from the Flamingo Gardens. Thank you all. Um, I'm Corey. I have been at Flamingo Gardens for about six and a half years now. Um, prior to that, um, I had been involved with the gardens with the plant shows. I knew Elizabeth before then. Um, I do want to introduce Elizabeth. Elizabeth is our curator of history. She's sitting right in the back, right in front of Steve. Um, she will be able to answer a little bit more of the in-depth questions. She's actually our history expert at Flamingo Gardens. So I am going to ask that throughout if you just wait and hold questions until the end so that way if it's something that I don't know, Elizabeth can answer it. I know a lot of the basics, but I don't know the full, full story. That's Elizabeth's forte. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of background for Flamingo Gardens. Um, we are a 60-acre 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a wildlife sanctuary where they rehabilitate native wildlife and try to release them back out in the wild. We also are a repository for them um, if they cannot be released out in the wild. Uh, we also have the Ray Botanical Collection there. And the Ray Botanical Collection, a lot of the trees that are still there have been there since Ray, the Rays planted them. Uh, granted, a lot of hurricanes have come through and different things. Um, but the Botanical Collection has been, pretty much been maintained since the Rays started planting them. We also have our Ray home, which was the initial home from the Rays that they built out there. Um, how do we get to that point, though? So I'm going to give you a little bit of the history about Floyd and Jane and how things progressed and how we got to Flamingo Gardens that it is now. So meet Floyd and Jane. Floyd and Jane were married in 1910. At the time, they were living in Evansville, Tennessee. Evansville, Tennessee, I think it is. Indiana. Indiana. I'm not good with my states, I think. <laughs> um, they were newcomers to Florida. They weren't familiar with it, um, but they did decide to take a chance. So they moved here in 1925 from the Midwest. Their accomplishments that they had while they were here served as an example for a lot of the community. Floyd? Ooh. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Floyd was very determined. He was a go-getter. He was very active in the community. And he did set a lot of things in place that helped with the transportation, that helped with the citrus industry, and just helped with the community in general. Jane, on her own, was also very prominent in the community and helped with helping with the arts. And also, she helped with the, promoting the citrus industry and the tourist industry down in Florida as well. <coughs> Floyd. Floyd was an interesting fellow. He really was. Um, in 1908, he graduated from Benton Harbor College with a business degree. At the time, he was working. At 1910, he married Jane, and they moved to Evansville, Indiana, where he worked his way up to manage the House of Crane Tobacco Company. Worked very hard to get to that point. He started out as a general worker and then worked his way up. In 1925, they decided that they wanted to move to Florida. So they moved to Florida and settled in Hollywood. In 1926, there was a devastating hurricane. And at this time, Floyd had been working with the Home Seekers, which was a real estate group that was headed by Joseph W. Young. After the hurricane, real estate just bottomed out. It was basically the boom. That was it. Kind of like what happened after the last, current, last uh, couple of hurricanes and our economy dropping. So Floyd, being the ever-determined person, decided that he wanted to try and find a new venture. So they had just wound up reclaiming a bunch of the Everglades land. And this Everglades land was just west of Davie. It was very inexpensive. And what Floyd surmised was that it was going to be very good for growing oranges, especially since the orange market was booming. There were all these winter oranges that were getting sold, and they were getting sold for a very high price. So what Floyd decided to do they decided to purchase property out there. So they first purchased, it was a total of 300 acres in 1927. Now these 300 acres were planted within, 40 acres of that were planted within the first year. He planted all Lu, God, I can never pronounce this right, Lu Gim Gong summer oranges because there were no one growing summer oranges. And since Florida's climate is fantastic at that time of year, all year round, basically, but it's fantastic at that time of the year. It was the perfect crop to grow. So they planted 40 acres and within the first year and then had another 300 acres ready to be planted after that. 
The first citrus tree was planted in February 22nd of 1927. And that is the beginning of Flamingo Groves. That's your right there. So Floyd brought in a few people with him. One of the first people he brought was the expert, which was Frank Sterling. He was the expert known for citrus in the area. He was widely known for that. So he brought him in. And when they incorporated Flamingo Groves, he was the vice president of Flamingo Groves. Floyd served as the president and also the treasurer, and his wife, Jane, served as the secretary for the organization. In 1928, they started planting the botanical gardens part of it. Now, this botanical gardens was from seeds collected by the, that was given to them by the government through a trade program. And like I said, most of those botanical gardens parts actually stay, and they're still there. Um, it was a great beginnings for Flamingo Groves. So, the groves. Well, when they first bought the groves, once again, it was in reclaimed ever Everglades. There were no major roads. The nearest road was four miles away. They could shuttle oranges and to ship them through the canals, but they couldn't have the public come. And Ray wanted the public to come and visit this place so they could see the beauty of South Florida. So, in 1929, the Rays paid one-third and the county paid the other two-thirds to pave and start construction on Flamingo Road. Now, I don't know how many of you have lived down here. I remember Flamingo Road back when I was a child. It was a two-lane death trap. There was a canal on one side, the canal on the other side. There were trees all over the place. If you went down the road more than 10 miles an hour, you were bumping all over the road. You needed to, get, you needed to basically get your alignment done like every month. Um, <laughs> It's not what it is today. Now it's six lanes wide and people do maybe about 80 miles an hour all the time. <laughs> so it was a lot different back then, a lot different back then. Um, State Road 84 was not what it is now. So this was a big step for them, for people to come out there. They really wanted the public to come and see this. They loved the beauty of South Florida and wanted to share it. So this was a great thing for them. There was an article written about the race about the Flamingo Groves that stated that it was one of the best producing groves in South Florida because of the muck soil that was on their property. Now this muck soil was reclaimed Everglades. So if you think about it, it made sense. It's Everglades, all the decomposed plants, all the decomposed animals, everything. There was a really high nutrients which was perfect for growing the oranges. So. They had a boon year in 1929. There were articles written about them. There was all sorts of wonderful things that were done. So it was looking like it was gonna be a great year for them. So unfortunately, the depression hit. Great Depression of 1929, October of 1929, the stock market crashed and things started to go south for many, many people. Floyd knew that in order to succeed, he was going to have to come up with some sort of plan to so keep the groves sustained. His plan was to sell five acre parcels of land to investors. They would hold on to it for five years until the trees matured. Once the trees matured, they would turn around, Flamingo Groves would turn around, harvest the fruit and sell it. And at this point, the investors could either keep the land and share in the profits or they could sell it back to Flamingo Groves. Basically, it was sharecropping. and was one of the first times that anybody had done it in the area. This helped sustain Flamingo Groves throughout the Great Depression. And because of his undaunting and staying with it and coming up with new ways of doing th these things, by the end of the Great Depression in 1939, Flamingo Groves had over 2,000 acres, and there were over 60 varieties of citrus, and there was also a 20-acre citrus laboratory on the property. So Flamingo Groves came out of the Depression as one of the largest producers of citrus in the south, south of Lake Okeechobee. It was a great start for them. So the citrus lab. What was the purpose of the Citrus Lab? 
Well, South Florida was a great place to grow plants. You could grow tropical and subtropical plants there, still is today. So, is that rain? Yeah. Wow, yep, welcome to South Florida. <laughs> um, Floyd knew that the muck soil from the Everglades was great for growing citrus. He knew it wasn't good for growing vegetables or a lot of other types of plants because it did lack some of the minor nutrients that the other plants needed. But it was fantastic for citrus. So he opened the lab so they could plant an extensive amount of citrus and not just oranges. We're talking grapefruits, lemons, limes, all sorts of citrus. And that way they could see which ones grew the best and they can also hybridize. They can cross pollinate them. They can do different things with them to create better and more tasty fruits and better sustaining trees as well. So the lab actually also did some fertilizer experiments with the trees to see which fertilizers were needed, if fertilizer was needed. And it actually benefited a lot of the other local growers that were in the area. The citrus industry. Uh-oh, I have a slide missing. Let me talk about the botanical gardens a little bit because there's a slide missing. That's not good. All right, so at the same time, the Rays actually started planting the botanical gardens and the botanical gardens was planted from seeds that were collected from the government. There was a seed share program and since the climate was so fantastic for growing these things there, it was a subtropical and tropical climate, there were seeds that were collected from all over the world and that way they could see which plants would grow best in Florida. This also has been continued down the road to now. A lot of the plants that we actually have at Flamingo Gardens are endangered or on the verge of extinction in their homelands. And we still plant, we still plant a lot of these plants now. Everything from palms, we also have a new, orchids, a new orchid collection that's going in that's going to incorporate a lot of the species orchids. That's going to also incorporate a lot of the native orchids. So this, can, this tradition of theirs of building this beautiful botanical gardens for people to enjoy and also learn and also see the beauty of what South Florida has to offer has been continued nowadays as well. All right, so the citrus industry. Well, the citrus industry, of course, everyone knows Florida. It's, what's our state license plate? It's a big orange. Florida is known for its oranges, but Flamingo Groves was one of the largest producers in South Florida at this time. In 1931, Floyd opened the first retail store with sales and shipping included. And then they also incorporated some souvenirs for the tourists and also postcards so people can take back some of the beauty of, of South Florida. The fruit could be shipped since they were nearby one of the rail trains, they could be shipped to people across the world, not just locals. A lot of the smaller growers were only dealing with locals. Floyd had a vision to get his oranges so that way the entire world could enjoy his oranges and also maybe encourage them to come and visit South Florida and see what a beautiful place it was. In 1934, Floyd had a small citrus packing plant and he decided to expand this packing plant and he built the first modern citrus plant in Broward on Federal Highway. The back of it was only a few yards away from the rail train, which means that they could literally pack it right there, put it on the train, and it could go to the port and be off to wherever it wanted to go. The building included a large retail area, and it was also designed without interior partitions. So if you were a visitor, you can come in, get a glass of orange juice, maybe buy some fruit, maybe buy a souvenir. And the whole time you were doing that, you could watch the whole packing process. You could watch the conveyor belt. You can watch how they packed the crates. You can see how they packed them and put them in the, and stick them back out in the truck. So you could watch the whole process from, from point A to point B. And it was great because tourists love seeing how their fruit was getting shipped. The airport was nearby, and the next thing you know, Floyd started shipping his, his uh, fruit by air. <coughs> it's quicker than train, and it was also able to expand him to going over to Europe and, over and overseas. 
Unfortunately, the original packing plant was torn down when they did the original Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport expansion. So unfortunately, it's no longer there. But a little side note, there is a place called Alex's Flamingo Groves. It's right there in Dania, if you're not familiar with it. It's in that little shopping center next to Dockers, I think it is. Um, not, not far from where the old Griffin Road is. That place is a bounty of like Florida native shells. They actually have some of the original packing plant um, pictures up on the walls and they still call it Alex's Flamingo Groves. Um, there is a lady by the name of Marguerite that works there and she's been there for 34 years I believe and she actually worked there when it was originally the packing plant. She's not always there, she travels a lot, but she, if you ever go in there, she's a fantastic lady. She is a wealth of knowledge. Um, so some of the history from the east side actually still exists, which is great. So Port Everglades. Floyd, of course, knew that shipping by boat was going to be one of the big things to help him get his fruit distributed all over. They could put it on the boat rather than a train and get it up to the northern part of the states. It can go across seas. There were many things that it could do. And the biggest thing, too, is it could bring tourists to us. It could bring people into us. It could expand the whole citrus industry for the state of Florida. So Floyd led the growth of the Broward's port in its early years. They transformed it from what you see here, the Bay Mabel Harbor in 1928, into the, what you see now, the Port Everglades. Now granted, he hasn't been through it the whole time, but he did help lead a lot of the, a lot of the upgrades that are now there. So it started out as Lake Mabel, is what the port started out with as, and it was a small little lagoon. It only had four foot of depth, which means basically you're gonna get a canoe through there. You're gonna get a little 17 foot boat in there. You're not gonna get much in there. So they went ahead and in 1927, the governor appointed a board of three to improve this harbor and expand it so that way they can get more trade and they can actually get more tourists and more ships to come in. Oh, sorry. The first elections of commissioners were in 1930, December, December of 1930, and Floyd was voted in by a landslide. He was definitely one of the commissioners. He was very well loved in his community, and they thought that he could definitely help them out with m in making improvements to this. Others elected were Thomas E. Swanson, John D. Sherwin, and A.J. Ryan. Now in 1931, it was a busy year for Floyd. He traveled to Washington to apply for, for, for funds for expansion of the port from the Army Corps of Engineers. He also solicited businesses with shipping companies that were in New York. This would actually be instrumental in helping them ship their fruit back and forth a little bit more, and also for their tourist trade. He also negotiated twice monthly sailings of the Baltimore and Carolina freighters that were to come into the port. And he also welcomed the first steamship cruise passengers from the cruise ships of the Great White Fleet of the United Fruit Company into the port. The port was growing and the port was becoming a world's port. In 1932, the Belcher, Fuel, Belcher Oil Company and the Standard Oil and American Oil Company all started regular service out of the port. He outlined plans for the reconstruction and finance for a loan to construct a pre-cooling and cold storage unit in a bonded warehouse to help with shipping of not just oranges, but other items as well. The port advanced from 135th place in foreign commerce in 1933 to 95th place and became a business export center for the citrus industry. In February of 1934, Floyd applied for another loan from the Public Work Board to construct slips two and three. By 1934, the exports jumped from 1,850 long tons to 10,859. Their revenue increased by over 300%. And because of the efforts of the commissioners and Floyd, the port now had become a world port. And it was seventh in the state of Florida for imports and exports. So this was your port in early, and these were your commissioners. 
port was a lot different back then, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, so these were some of your first, this was the expansions back in the 1930s. This was your first passenger ship that came through. And then your freighters, of course. Now, the freighters, if, I don't know if any of you go out and sit and watch the stuff coming in. I love going out there and watching the ships come in and out. It is busy. Can you imagine how it must have seemed back then? We're used to seeing these things that are coming in now. Back then, this was all new to the people back then. This was amazing. So granted, the community was loving this. And of course, USS Langley, 1933, was the first aircraft carrier to come in. And those are some of your cruise lines that came in. Now, Port Everglades, became a regular stop for ships on the way to Cuba. Tourists came from Europe, and the port was booming. In December of 1934, the election was coming up for the next term. Floyd, once again, won by a landslide as one of the commissioners. Unfortunately, a lot of the community, a lot of businesses, and others decided that there was nothing right with this election. Nothing to do with Ray himself. He was never implicated in anything. It's just they didn't like the way the election went. So there was a dispute, there was bickering, and there was a battle for many, many, many months. Floyd, being the dedicated person that he was, kept himself away from all of it and still continued to do his job. Floyd pushed forward and did all, and did all of his job. In 1935, Floyd represented the, the port at a congressional meeting in order to secure more funds. $1,134,000 was granted to the port improvements to further the entrance to the basin, which means that the port would now also become a bigger port. Larger ships could come in, more ships could come in. So Floyd was still doing a great job. In April, he reached an agreement with Thomas Cook and Son for convention business and the Holland American to bring one of their biggest ships into the port. The first molasses stores tanks were constructed and Standard Oil and Belcher Oil also built their first tank farms. Those are your tank farms right there. So that way they can have their oil right there at the port. So Floyd was very, very busy. By the time May of 1935 came around, state legislation had decided that the election was invalid. The governor of the state, was appointed to choose three commissioners. The three commissioners that were, choose, were chosen did not include Floyd Ray. Had nothing to do with what he did, had nothing to do that he, he was not implicated in anything. They, he just chose three people that were part of his political affiliation. So Floyd's reign in the commissioner of the port ended, but that does not mean he stopped there. <laughs> Floyd continually promoted tourism in South Florida. Flamingo Groves would offer free tours to any of the tourists that were coming in. They handed out flyers, please come and visit our, gar our groves, please visit our botanical gardens. In early 1929, they offered these free trips as an incentive for people to come out there. They also knew that anyone that was a tourist was traveling during this time was going to have a little bit of money. They might be able to invest and they would also help spend money in the community. So Floyd encouraged people, come out, we'll give you a free bus ride, we'll give you a free ride out there. Come and visit it, see what this is like. As soon as there was fruit on the trees, Floyd was selling it to the visitors who loved it. All the retail fruit shipping outlets not only sold the citrus, but they also offered Florida souvenirs and postcards, which people also loved as well. The trains were very close to where the cruise ships came in. So Floyd decided that that should be made a stop for the trains. And they would offer the bus rides from all the lines. It would be advertised on the trains as a place, as a destination to come to when, you, when the train stopped there. The Sealed Sweet Chronicle of 1930 reported that the back country of the Lower East Coast is being developed to supplement tourist trade and ensure continued prosperity at Flamingo Groves near Davie. Floyd, over his years, was reported about in the newspaper quite a few times because of his accomplishments. 
Floyd also arranged for the bus lines to make a stop at the railway station so that way everyone can interconnect properly. He also, <laughs> this is great, the World's Fair, 1933 and 1934. So in order to help promote the citrus industry and tourism in Florida, Floyd set out to do a display at the World's Fair. This, of course, was the indoor display. It included orange trees, it included fish, it included different flora and fauna from the state of Florida. In addition, he dug up several trees from the groves and transported them to the World's Fair and created a miniature grove so people could actually see what the groves look like. It's fantastic. And it did help because think about it, the World's Fair, not close to here, and people are gonna be traveling a long ways if they wanna see what they're gonna be getting. So it was perfect, it helped, and it helped with booming the tourist industry and it also helped with booming the citrus industry. In 1955 and 1956, President Eisenhower and First Lady visited the Little White House, a retreat in the Naval Station in Key West. Eisenhower had just gotten over a heart attack and was recuperating at the, at the Little White House. Well, Floyd thought it would be a nice thing to send them some of the finest fruits and a couple of crates of fruit to them. Well, he was so, they were so appreciative that he actually was written hand letters to them thanking him for his delicious fruit. Not very many people would do something like that. I don't know. I would, but it was great business because if he's got the president on his side, everyone should be having some of the fruit from down here and should be visiting. He was very smart when he came to promoting stuff. So Floyd Ray was also a civic leader. Floyd was not just successful in his citrus business as a commissioner of the, and, and a commissioner of the Port Everglades. He was active in the affairs of the city, country, state, and shared his skills and times to make difference in the life of the community as a whole. He was on the board of directors of the First National Bank in Fort Lauderdale, which, then be, which later became the Landmark Bank. In 1929, he served as a substitute municipal judge for the city of Hollywood. He was also a founding member of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce and served as president from 1929 to 1930 and also from 1937 to 1938. He was a founding member of the Broward City Chamber of Commerce and served as a member of the Pan American Committee of the Florida State Chamber of Commerce for two years. Once again, there was an article written about him. <laughs> He was an active member of the Lions Club, and in his, li in his time, <laughs> in his time, no, you're good. In his time at the Lions Club, he served the community very well, and due to this, they awarded him with the President's Award. Now, Monty, Monty says, was an article written by Carlton Montaigne, and it touted that. No one has ever won so many awards in one year as Floyd had. So he was very well known in his community. He was very well liked because of his efforts to help support the community. Orange Brook, we were just talking about this. <laughs> so he was a big sportsman as well. He loved riding, fishing. He also loved hunting. He loved golf. So in 1934, uh, 1930, the golf course downtown catered to hotel guests and to members. It wasn't really an open to the public place because the fees, if you were coming in and you weren't a member or a hotel guest, the fees were a little bit steep for most of the general public. So he figured that there was a need for having a municipal golf course. Floyd became the chairman of the Golf Association and helped to found and finance Orange Brook Golf and Country Club without the cost to the city. It became known as one of the best 18-hole golf courses in the South. And from what I'm hearing, it's not looking good for the Orange Brook, so they'll be talking about that afterwards. There's actually a plaque at the Orange Brook Golf Club with his name on it saying thank you. Um, both Floyd and Jane also enjoyed riding, 
They love Tennessee walking horses, so they actually purchased some and they were breeding and also using them for shows. They won lots of awards for their shows, and some of their animals were, the were some of the best produced as far as the Tennessee walkers. Floyd also loved fishing, and in this photo right here, one of those, the 10 pound bass that he actually caught to boast about his wonderful skills as a fisherman, he actually had it stuffed and mounted and it was hanging in Flamingo Garden, in Flamingo Groves, so everyone can see what a great fisherman he was. He was a very humble man, but you gotta brag a little bit. <laughs> so by his side, he couldn't have done all of this unless he had Mrs. Ray by his side. They were a very, very influential couple. Back at that time when they were married, women were deemed a little bit different than they are now. Times were different. It wasn't until 1920 when women had the right to vote. And even then, because of the Depression, feminism kind of went by the wayside because of the Depression. Jane was first and foremost Mrs. Floyd L. Ray, which meant she did what most women at that time did. She helped host the parties. She supported her husband and his businesses. She also planned the little get-togethers. At any given moment, if he turned around and says, oh, we're having a guest, we're having 50 guests coming, or we're having 200 guests coming, she would jump right to it, grab out her book of recipes, and like nothing, she would whip together that little gathering. Mm -hmm. She also helped with breeding and showing their Tennessee Walker horses. And she was a good companion and supported her husband's work. But Jane Ray was a prominent citizen of her own. She had her own interest. And since Floyd a lot of times was busy with the business, she went ahead and started forging some of her own community efforts. She was invited to host the formal opening of the newly created Hollywood Public Library in 1927. She also was an accomplished pianist. She taught music. Jane also wrote this great little verse about the Tangelo. That was one of their hybrids that they created at Flamingo Groves. Sorry. <laughs> um, which actually was sent out with some of the crates of fruit to some of the customers one year. <laughs> she was also an avid gardener. She had a wonderful rose garden, which some of the rose, the rose bushes still exist at the gardens today. Not all of them, but some of them do. Um, and she was a great supporter of the cultural arts. In fact, in 1967, if I remember correctly, 1967, I believe it is, 66, she actually devised the garden galleries at Flamingo Gardens. Now, we have our gallery that's there right now, and that was part of it. The garden galleries was, in, was actually one of the old stables, which they no longer had the horses, so they actually turned one of the old stables into an actual gallery. The gallery still exists today, and we still do art exhibits in there. In fact, we just got done doing our Borowski glass. Next year will be dinosaurs. Can't wait. <laughs> um, so she was a great supporter of the arts, and she wanted to support local artists. So they opened the galleries. Her big thing was she wanted people to come and visit the gardens. And so she also helped maintain the botanical gardens and she also wanted to protect the native species. And she wanted to educate the students and also the general public about the beauty and the native wildlife and native plants of South Florida. So, Floyd and Jane Ray in the Rose Garden. So Flamingo Gardens is now what Flamingo Grows has turned into. We are celebrating our 91st anniversary this year. Last year was our big 90th. Um, there are over 100,000 guests. I think that number is actually a little bit bigger now. There are over 100,000 guests from around the world visiting Flamingo Gardens each year. We still have passengers from the cruise ships that come and visit. We also still have the educational groups that come in with our educational programs. So the school children actually get to learn different things about our wildlife and also different things about our native plants. We have locals that sometimes become members 
and we have a great support staff. The Ray home has been turned into a museum, so people can actually hear the history about Flamingo Groves and also hear a little bit of history about the area. The wildlife sanctuary has grown exponentially. When Flamingo, Gar when Flamingo Groves first started, there was actually a native flock of wildlife that was there, flamingos. Because back then, flamingos were kind of native. You found them everywhere. So Jane created the Flamingo Pond. And to this day, the Flamingo Pond still exists. We also, she also, because of her gardening, she loved having the peacocks. So she actually had peafowl introduced into flamingo groves and their descendants are still with us nowadays. You can hear them during mating season all day long. <laughs> the babies are really, really cute though. <laughs> the, but of course, the flamingo pond is still the highlight of everyone's visit to there. So, Baby Jane. Yay. We're going to end with Baby Jane. <laughs> Baby Jane was born on August 1st. And obviously, why is she called Baby Jane after Jane? She is the first flamingo born from our own stock in the history of flamingo gardens. So none of the flamingos that have ever been there have ever been born from the flock. Any of the flamingos, if the if the herd got a, if the flock got a little bit too low, they would actually have eggs shipped in that they would incubate and then they would imprint as soon as they were born. So baby Jane is history in the making, just like Jane herself was. So baby Jane, there she is. She is adorable. You just want to hug her and squeeze her and hold her. <laughs> So baby Jane was born on August 1st and she's doing fantastic. She is actually growing by leaps and bounds. <laughs> um, the thing about baby Jane, just real quick, when the flamingos hatch from their egg, the first flamingo that they see, that is who they imprint on. And for the sake of Every year we've gotten eggs. None of them have ever been viable. But every year they go through the same process. Whenever there's eggs, as soon as they're laid, they pull them for safety reasons. Because we are in outdoor botanical gardens. And even though the flamingo pond is protected, it still is not protected from raccoons and other wildlife. So what they do, and they do this with all of our exposed exhibits like that, once the babies are born, if they see that there's going to be a, once the eggs are, ha once the eggs are laid, if they see that there's going to be an issue, they will pull the eggs. And that's exactly what they did. There were 10 eggs in total. Baby Jane was the only one to hatch. It was the only one that was viable. And of course, Laura Wyatt, our curator of wildlife, was the one attending to this. So now baby Jane thinks that Laura is her mom. <laughs> she follows her everywhere. She takes her for walks and when she was a, when she was first hatched, she needed to be fed 6 times a day minimum. So she made a special formula for her and she would actually syringe feed her and she would be basically doing the mom's care for her. So now when you do go out there and you see her Laura is the one that goes out there with her, brings her out to the pond. She's slowly getting integrated more and more into the flock, into the flamboyance, I should say. And trust me, she is flamboyant. <laughs> um, so they bring her out there and all the other flamingos are out there. She'll flap her wings. She'll try to fly even though, no. <laughs> um, she does cute things like this, but most of all, she follows Laura around. That's our mom. So I think that's it. I wanted to end on a happy note. <laughs> so if you have any questions, feel free. I'm sure I forgot a few things. But if you have any questions. Yes. yes. Did Rays have any children? Rays did not have any children. Rays did not have any children. Um, Jane was fantastic because she had the foresight to dedicate Flamingo Gardens and to create the Floyd L. Ray Memorial Foundation. So that way future generations could go through and actually experience the beauty of South Florida and that way they could also learn the history of the area. Um, 
because of that, that's why Flamingo Groves exists now. Um, basically, Flamingo Groves was their baby, was their baby. I wanted to add that um, Jane Reed's mother's sister married a man named Wood. Yes. His son, Robert R. Wood, came down to visit quite often, and he had a son, Robert L. Wood. Robert L. moved his family to Flamingo Groves when he was, he was down there often when he was a teenager, mm. but once he married, he moved the family to Flamingo Groves and was the general manager there. And Stan Wood, who is the executive director and on the board as trustees, is what they call a nephew. He came to Flamingo Grove when he was two. And I just heard the sweetest story. They <laughs> behind Ray home. Mm -hmm. They moved down there. Stan was two and he had his tricycle. So they built a little narrow sidewalk from the one house over to Ray <laughs> and come to visit. He treated, they treated the children on the grounds as if they were their own children and grandchildren. Yep. So it's still looked over by close family members. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I did introduce Elizabeth, right? Yes. Did I? Okay, okay, okay. I was in, I'm like, woo, that's not good. <laughs> Tell me, does the color of the flamingos have to do with the food that they eat? Yes, it does. It's not necessarily the, it's, it's the algae. Algae? They eat some algae of the shrimp. Food? They do eat the shrimp, yeah. but the shrimp, it's actually coming from the algae. I see, I see. Flamingos, this is really cool. Flamingos, you see that curved beak right there? Yes. So when you see flamingos eat, it's not just because they're tall that they actually have their head upside down. They're kind of lanky, they're kind of awkward, and they always look kind of awkward. But there's a purpose to their head being um, upturned, to being downturned like that. So usually they're sifting through the water to get the food and the nutrients. Well, inside their mouth, they actually have kind of like a filter. It's kind of like, a, it's almost like taking a mesh sieve and filtering it out. And what that does is it actually collects the algae and it collects the nutrients that are in the water. And that's how they actually get the color. They take the algae in. So even if they're eating the shrimp, they're still sifting through the water to get that algae. And depending on the content of your algae, we have our water that comes into our flamingo pond comes from our back lake. So it's actually natural water that comes up and it's high, high in algae that is great for them. We do two feedings a day for the flamingos to supplement what they're getting out of the actual flamingo pond, um, just to make sure that they actually have enough to eat. And the food that they feed does have the extra nutrients in there to keep the color as well. So right now, because she's a baby, she doesn't have that full color. Um, but as she gets older and she starts living at the actual flamingo pond full time, she'll start developing that as her adult feathers start coming in. Because I saw different colors. Yeah, there's, um, we actually have three different kinds of flamingos there. Yeah. Baby Jane, they're not 100% sure yet because she might be a hybrid. Um, they're actually planning on doing a DNA test to make sure that she is a female because until they start laying eggs, you don't really know. Most birds, you don't know what they are until they start laying eggs. Um, they're calling her baby Jane. We might have to change it to baby Floyd. <laughs> Um, but we have three different types of flamingos there. We have the Caribbean flamingos, which are your standard peach, pink, salmon color ones. But we also have greater flamingos there, and we also have a Chilean flamingo there that were donated to us from another organization. So even though the eggs were taken from the nest of one of the Caribbean flamingos, we might have a hybrid. We don't know. <laughs> so we'll, we'll keep you posted. <laughs> Go ahead. Did you say that... Flamingos are, were native to Florida? They were considered a native bird because they were found in such abundance down here. What would happen is the flamingos are actually a migratory bird. So what they would do is in their migration, they would come through. The same thing happens with swans. So a lot of times you see swans that live down here. Well, the swans aren't actually, were not actually indigenous to this area. It's just that a lot of times it was a migratory bird. And if they liked it and where they're at and they felt safe, they would stay. And that's what wound up happening with a lot of the flamingos. It was during the migratory season, they stopped and they enjoyed, they found that there was an abundance of food. They found that it was safe for them and they decided to stay. So back in that time, there were a lot of, all, right? very rarely. There is 
there is a flock that is somewhere over on the west coast or down in the keys they're watching two they're watching two flocks it's a small group that they say have actually not left that they've come through the migratory pattern and they're there and they're residing there and they've been there for a couple of years now if they'll stay there permanently they don't know but that's why everybody associates oranges, flamingos, palm trees. That's the big thing that everybody associates Florida with. And that's part of it is because they were considered native back then. Go ahead, you were first. I'm wondering why it took 91 years for this age to happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, flamingos are very, very picky when it comes to their breeding habits. The temperature has to be just right. The humidity has to be just right. There has to be a certain number of flamingos in their flock. And even then, they could build the nest, go through the whole nine yards, but the eggs will get laid, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the deed was done. So they're very, very, very finicky about all this. So the fact that this is actually a viable egg is fantastic because our, our flamboyance is really not a big enough size to reproduce for. Usually they have to be at least 25 flamingos. And ours, I think, are, we only have about 15 or 16 in our, in our flock. Um, the humidity has to be just right. The temperature has to be just right. And considering that she was born August 1st, it was generally a little bit too hot for the eggs to be viable at that time. So this is really a rare and unusual occurrence. I mean, we're loving it. We still haven't figured out why it happened, but we're ecstatic that it had. So, go ahead. Um, still on the subject of birds. Yes. Uh, several years ago, Bonded House in Fort Lauderdale mm -hmm. donated to Flamingo Gardens mm -hmm. uh, one of their two swans, which was not yes. along with the other swan, which happens to be yes. father. Yes. And I wondered if you could give an update. I think her name was Helen. Helen, as far as I know, she's still in the rookery. Um, I know they had to shift her around a little bit to get her to settle in, but I think she's finally settled into the rookery. Um, we, do, we do that a lot of times. Whenever we get new animals that come in, especially if they're coming from another place where they're used to other people, um, what they wind up doing is just kind of watching them, overseeing them, and if they see that there's issues, they'll shift them around and put them where they think they should be going. But as far as I know, she's the one that's in our rookery, and she's doing fantastic with the sandhills, so... That's a great little spot. Lots of stuff to eat. So she's good. Go ahead. Uh, I'm a South Florida native. Yes. Uh, before <laughs> football, it was a practice, especially in the Depression and a little later, to take a Sunday afternoon drive. And that, was, that was a pretty cheap treat. A new treat for the family. <laughs> <laughs> One Sunday afternoon, my daddy said, we're, I left in my, we're going up to Flamingo Gardens. Well, that sounds pretty dark. <laughs> <laughs> and we went all through it, went back to the car, and Dad turned on the car radio. It was December 7th, 1941. Oh. 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 I have this memory of all these people having this wonderful time on Sunday afternoon. During that year. Oh. By the next year, I just realized when we talked about the port, one of our Saturday and Sunday afternoon drives was to go up to Port Everglades and look at the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> the British ran a German ship into the port before we got in the war. And those poor guys were stranded there all during the war. Oh, <laughs> poor, poor guys. For a couple of years, and then they were for years until forty-one, and then they were um, they were interned at Port uh, Ellis Island. Oh wow! They weren't POWs. They were See, and I thought I was teaching you today. I'm learning some great stuff. <laughs> go ahead. I can add something to that. We used to go to the port to watch the submarine races when I was in. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Go ahead, sir. Uh, 
Hi. Um, I like to switch topics from the birds and the, the animals yeah, yeah. to the plants. Yes, yes, yes. You mentioned something about the uh, orchids, new, new orchids coming. We have, we now, for the past few years, have had the American Orchid Society West Palm Beach Judging Center meeting at the Flamingo Gardens. Um, they do their once a month meetings there, and we also have the Flamingo Gardens Orchid Society that has been in, around for a very long time, but they've been back at the gardens as well for about the last six years. Um, both of them see the need for integrating some more orchids into our gardens because they're just a beautiful thing, and we have so many fantastic native species in Florida that are going extinct because of deforestation and, you know, you know how that goes. So what they both came up with was a volunteer group called the Flamingo Gardens Orchideers. And what they do is they actually get from local growers and also from their own personal collections and from different donations and in some of them buy some of the plants. But what they're doing is they're installing a lot of the species orchids that not just from Florida, but also from across the world that are going endangered in their native homelands and that also are specific species. Um, a lot of them are not, there's a lot of older ones. Um, a lot of the members from the Flamingo Gardens Orchid Society and the AOS have great huge collections. And what they're doing is they're taking some of their larger plants that can no longer be found, that are no longer in production and they're dividing them. So that way we can actually have a sample of them at the gardens. So we are having a great orchid collection that's actually being instituted at Flamingo Gardens. Okay. And then on top of it, they are working on a native species that will be going, I don't, how many of you have been to Flamingo Gardens? Oh, wow, okay, <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Usually it's only like a couple hands and stuff, that's not awesome. Um, so the back 50 acres of Flamingo Gardens, oh, there's a lot of areas back there, I mean 90% of it, even though there's parts of it like the Cycad Garden, there's the rainforest, there's the fruit trees, um, a lot of it is very much native back there, especially along the Pioneer Walkway and around the, the wetlands area. Um, so that area back there is specifically being targeted to put a lot of the native orchids because it will go with that native collection that's back there. And that's going to be more for establishing more of the native species than a visual thing for the public. Although once they do get established, the public, because you can walk around the Pioneer Walkway. They did fix up the Pioneer Walkway, so you can walk through that walkway again. And they did fix up the back wharf a few years ago, so you can actually get off on that and look at that area as well. So they're instituting a lot of the native orchids back in that area, which is fantastic um, because we did have some. Um, but this is great because it's going to actually be part of the botanical collection. It's going to be cataloged. It's going to be logged in, everything. So it's going to be have huge. They, have they thought about joining Fairchild with the uh, million dollars? Um, they're going to be doing their own project down here. Um, we've tried working with Fairchild, um, but the, it's just not going to work. With them being that down there and, down, and us being down here, um, they have their own AOS group judging center that meets down there. So... We don't want to cause any conflict. <laughs> and a little quick thing, sorry, a little quick thing about Fairchild. Flamingo Groves has actually been around for almost 10 years longer than Fairchild. And Flamingo Groves up until about, was it four years ago that we went public, Elizabeth? About four years ago, right? Yeah. I don't remember the timeline. But up until about four years ago, we were strictly funded by private donations, which there weren't that many, and by the foundation itself. Because when, she, when Jane set up the foundation, um, it dedicated to specifically the 60, give or take 66 acres, 65 acres that Flamingo Groves is now. That was specifically dedicated as Flamingo Gardens, and that's when it was, that's when it was named as Flamingo Gardens. Um, along with that, another 100 acres was stated to be used as sale property in order to fund the initial investment and the initial funding. So the foundation basically took care of Flamingo Gardens when it first started. There were no federal grants, no state grants, no county grants, no city grants. None of that applied because Flamingo Gardens was actually under a private foundation. Corporations don't donate to those places. So basically, Flamingo Gardens from 1969 up until four years ago survives solely on visitor admissions, the foundation, and any few little donations that people would give. So 
that speaks volumes for Flamingo Gardens. Yeah. And it speaks volumes for the history that's there because people know that history. And the, few, and the few people that have been dedicated to this place know what a gem this little place is. It is a botanical gardens. It is a wildlife sanctuary. There is a history there. There is education there. We are basically multifaceted and there's no other place like it in the state of Florida. And I don't think there's any place like it in the United States, at least not incorporated into one place like that. So, um, we actually have now, Flamingo Gardens itself is now incorporated as a public 501c3 nonprofit. Whereas before, it was still a 501c3 nonprofit, but it was funded under the foundation. Now we are a public 501c3 foundation, which means that we do qualify now for city grants, state grants, county grants. Um, and it's been fantastic. It's taken quite a few years. I started there six and a half years ago. And when I got hired, the gentleman that was in my position doing, that was the director of special events, is now our executive director. And the reason why he's our executive director is because he has given his heart and soul. That is Keith. That is the gentleman that was supposed to be here. He has given his heart and soul to this place. And all of us work there because we love it. We don't do it for the money. We don't do it because it's a job. We do it because it's in our heart. We love this place. And he has given his heart and soul in, the, in that short amount of time. I've seen him do wonders for that place. He is the reason why Flamingo Gardens is the great place that it is today. It's always been a fantastic place, but he is moving in the right direction. We will be getting a new welcome center that is going to be getting built. It's our new, it's our newest adventure. <laughs> yes, it's our newest adventure. It is going to be a huge welcome center, not just for Flamingo Gardens, but it's also going to be, our welcome center is also going to be a hub for Broward County as a welcome center. So we're not just going to offer things for Flamingo Gardens. We're going to offer things for other places as well. There's going to be a huge meeting room facility in there. It's, it's really going to start bringing us into the 21st century. <laughs> now, I had a question as to whether or not you gave lessons on how to care for orchids. Um, Flamingo Gardens Orchid Society and the AOS meet there. Um, the AOS meets there the fourth Saturday of every month, except for in November and December. They are fantastic. They do lectures, they do things like that, and they can actually help guide you with stuff like that. Okay. The Flamingo I, Gardens. I kill everything, so it's Flamingo <laughs> Gardens Orchid. In fact, the Flamingo Gardens Orchid Society oh, meeting wow. is going to be tomorrow night. It's at 7 p.m. and it's actually in Flamingo Gardens. It's inside the gallery. Um, and they are fantastic. The members are amazing, amazing group of people. Um, they are very open to helping people out. I mean, I've, I've actually, I'm not a society person. Certain ones I am. I just don't have the time. You know, it's like I'm not consistent. And I feel bad if I'm not consistent. But with this particular one, I absolutely adore these people. They are fantastic. They are so willing to embrace newcomers. They are so willing to help out. And their love and their passion is for, for the orchids. And it's one of the better flaming, one of the better orchid societies. And they're great about giving tips and things like that. Go ahead. Now that you're a charitable organization, are the, are the donations tax deductible? Yes, they are. See that, people? Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. We do not have the packing and shipping anymore. Unfortunately, over the years, especially after the quite a few hurricanes, um, the majority of the orange grows are gone. Plus from age, you know, orange trees after a few years, the fruit just doesn't start producing as well. What they've done is in place a lot of the citrus uh, where the groves, with the section of the um, Flamingo Gardens that's still the groves. What they've done is replaced a lot of those trees with mangoes. And the mangoes, we have, I think, over 25 different varieties that are planted out there now. And we're finally starting to get some fruit off of them now. I mean, the past couple of years, we've had huge years, especially after last year's hurricane. The trees were stressed when they bloomed out this year. So we had a bounty crop. Um, but there are still quite a few of the original fruit trees that are still out there. Um, but we don't do the fruit shipping anymore, and we don't do the fresh squeezed orange juice out there anymore, unfortunately. Sad. Yeah. To my dismay, because we used to go out there. I used to go out there as a kid with my family, and we'd get the fresh juice and get the fruit and stuff. So it's kind of sad. Go ahead. You said it's 
now 65 acres. Is that 65 acres is what actually Flamingo but Gardens is. It was much larger. So you said something about selling the land. Um, what happened to the rest of the land is what I'm saying. I don't know the whole history. Do you know the whole history about the rest of the land? I know. Most of the, most of the growth was sold off to fund the foundation. Some was given in her will to fund the foundation. Some was given to the foundation. Yeah. I mean, it was initially, it was that, yeah, but specifically she had dedicated that 65 acres to stay there because it had the home on it. That was the original, that was part of the original plot that they had bought. That was part of the original plan. So that's why she wanted it there. Do you know where they lived in Hollywood? I don't know the exact house in Hollywood. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Actually, I lived right down the street from there. <laughs> That's awesome. Go ahead. On that order, um, you showed a picture of the rays in front of the um, Chamber of Commerce. Yes. Where was the Chamber of Commerce located? That I don't know. I don't know all the history of where. Where was the original building of the Chamber of Commerce? Yeah, the original Chamber of Commerce. That they showed in that picture, do you know? The original building of the Chamber of Commerce was about one room. Oh, okay. He was active once he came, but it was, he wasn't a founder of it. This was a beautiful building, but that picture was on the front page of the newspaper uh, just mm -hmm. after World War II, and it was a setup. And the caption underneath said, "Floyd and Jane Ray don't mind." Yes, and tire ratio. Right. They just hook up the horse and the horse. <laughs> I mean, they really were flora and fauna lovers. I mean, they loved the plants. They, they really embraced South Florida. And considering that they came from a harsher climate that they grew up in, it, it's amazing how much they actually loved down here. One of the first snowbirds. Yep. <laughs> yep. Any other questions? No? Nope? Okay. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, here, I can shut that. And here, I'll shut that off so it's not burning. Um, I actually will go around and hand out some of these. Um, this is actually the little pamphlet that we use at Flamingo Gardens, and it gives you basically the basics. And I'm going to give you guys. I mean, you've all been there. If any of you want a map, you can just. Yeah, you've never been there? Okay. So if anybody doesn't. Have uh, have never been there. Mm -hmm. It's really a great place. Their home on the there. Mm -hmm. Isn't it gorgeous? It's 